Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're discussing the impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had on medical students. I'm joined today by Dr. Kimberly Lomas, AMA's Vice President for Undergraduate Medical Ed Education Innovations. Uh, Dina Kashawi, a fourth year medical student at Loyola University's Stritch School of Medicine and Jordan Lippincott, a third year medical student at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Jordan and Dina, this is probably a very different school year uh, than you'd imagine. How has this pandemic affected your life and your education? I think for fourth years, it's a little bit of a bittersweet moment um, for us, at least in Chicago, our match day ceremonies were canceled entirely and they transitioned to a virtual match uh, ceremony online. And for us, graduation has been, at first it was canceled, but then they decided to postpone it until August if students were able to return. Um, so for us, it was a little bit of, you know, all of the fourth year plans that you've worked so hard for throughout medical school and you're always anticipating second semester, fourth year, but this wasn't really the opportunity for it, obviously given the circumstances. I think for third years, it's really thrown a wrench into the educational process for us. Um, most third, year, third years were in clerkships and core rotations and to be pulled, um, especially for me at my school, pulled from rotations um, to kind of prevent the use of PPE and um, the burden on the healthcare system. It's really changed our schedules coming up for the next year. Um, third years have step two CK and CS coming up in the next couple months and we're unsure if these tests are even gonna be offered if we're even going to have the correct clinical experiences before we get into them. So it's definitely a lot of amb ambiguity that we've seen um, in our educational process and even just managing life as well. Um, coming out of clinic so soon and knowing where you'll be, where your housing will be, uh, it's a lot of questions that um, don't really have answers quite yet. So it's, it's making it difficult for everyone. Yeah, there is ambiguity. Uh, uh, and Dina, you're heading into residency. Uh, what what's the prognosis for you coming up? So my residency program was very straightforward with a start date, but they also mentioned like if things were to change, they would contact us as soon as possible. At least from my perspective and my co-interns, it looks like we'll be starting mid-June as tentatively scheduled. Um, I think the, the most difficult thing though in this time is for fourth years who are moving across the country or just moving in general to other parts of the city, it's such a difficult time to be thinking about a move, packing up where you're originally at, where your medical school is, and then you know relocating to a city that you might have been in for 24, 48 hours during interview season, or maybe moving to a different part of the city just because um, it's closer to residency. So I think for us, that's where that ambiguity comes in is how soon do we have to start making that move? How quickly do we have to pack up from where we're currently stationed and then head out and really what that looks like for the rest of the year for us. Yes, I'm having difficulty contemplating moving outside of my house, so I can't imagine uh, the ambiguity surrounding having to move yeah. to a different city, start a new program. Uh, Dr. Lummis, uh, clearly these are some you know, big issues that medical students are dealing with. You know, can you tell us what the AMA is doing to support them? Sure, Todd. And first, I want to thank Dina and Jordan for sharing their struggles and their insights. I think the first step is it's really critical for students to be aware that the faculty are very aware of these concerns and are trying quickly to respond. These are difficult challenges for everyone. Both also want to thank both of you for your leadership in other contexts. Uh, it's been great to watch your, your career paths. Um, I would say that our, our work at the AMA Education Unit falls into two major buckets in which one is we advocate for students and the other is that we work directly with medical educators to tackle these big challenges. So some of the things that we've been very busy to do is to help provide medical education insight to other units in the AMA, such as our advocacy group, who is working with policy at the policy level, sharing your concerns and thinking about solutions, even in things like the congressional appropriations bills contributing to news stories, making sure that the education piece is accounted for and, and thought through. Uh, and then of course, on for our own educators, we were hosting an online uh, community discussion. It's not limited to educators, it's actually open to anyone to think through what are the problems. We might not have the answers yet, but it's a space that we can share, share the problems. And then we also had things like a series of webinars to address some of these issues. 
What I'm pleased to talk about, though, is it, as both Dina and Jordan are aware, many of these concerns cannot be solved within the context of one institution. These are things particularly Jordan's concern around the match, but also, you know, Dina's talking about moving from one institution to another. These are things that really require oversight by more than just any given school. And that's where the AMA plays a major influence. So there's a body known as the Coalition for Physician Accountability, of which AMA is one of the alphabet soup organizations that have responsibility for different pieces and parts of all this. So other, other institutions in this include AAMC, ACGME, LCME, NBME, the list goes on. It's all the right people to have this conversation. And that group happened to have a call scheduled this week for another reason. We were talking about the downstream implications of changing step one to pass fail. Now everything is disrupted about the entire system. Uh, so Dr. Susan Skoshalak in our unit, uh, who's our chief medical education officer at the AMA, led that group to think about responding to these urgent needs around disruptions related to COVID. And so I'm excited to say that that group is taking ownership and is launching four immediate work groups to address many of the issues that are pressing for students on a tight timeline. We have uh, deadlines within a couple of weeks to eight weeks, depending on the topic. So some more news coming very soon about that. And hopefully it's a step forward to get the answers that you're also desperate to hear. Well, we know one of the big changes, uh, you know, came through the AAMC. Uh, in terms of the guidance uh, for students to suspend activities that involve direct patient contact. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jordan and Dina, you know, how has this affected you? Obviously, that's a big part of your education and training. And, you know, in what ways are you and your fellow students being able to contribute during this time? So, in Chicago, for at least for the fourth years by now, a lot of us have already finished our core clerkships. So, the things that we were planning on doing for the rest of the year were electives that we're specific to our um, specialty that we're going into. So for example, there were like ultrasound electives planned and EKG electives planned where you wanna be in person, obviously to understand the nuances behind getting all of that um, with your patient experiences. Within the first few weeks, they transitioned it into online. So learning how to read EKGs in a systematic way online, reading ultrasound, but ultimately it came down to those activities were not really meeting the objectives of the fourth years that were um, interested in learning how to interact with patients during those testing um, procedures. So our school gave us the option then um, to help participate in an entirely student run call center for our medical school and our hospital system. And they had students run um, three shifts from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, seven days a week, answering and triaging calls and directing people to the different locations that they can come in for testing if necessary, understanding their symptoms um, and sort of how it all looked in relation. And so for the fourth years, it was a good way to at least interact with patients and give back to the um, give back to the community and to the entire hospital environment. How about you, Jordan? You know, I know on my behalf, um, our school is really focusing on um, several principles um, to, for our experiences right now. One, no experience in which we'd be at risk for potentially contracting um, the virus. And two, um, experiences in which we don't utilize PPE, um, just because there's already a burden, there's already not enough. So if students are using them in whatever capacity, um, we want to minimize that and put that towards our frontline workers. Michigan State University has been very adaptive. We um, immediately moved the end of our clerkships um, immediately to virtual learning. Um, unfortunately, some students lost out on a lot of clinic and patient encounter, but moving to virtual learning, they could still fill in a lot of those gaps. Um, right now, actually, just before this, I finished our first week of our COVID-19 elective, where we're actually looking at the epidemiology, ethics, and other considerations of um, pandemics and obviously COVID-19 in, um, in general um, in preparation for getting us out back into the healthcare system. So we're looking at donning and doffing PPE, how to treat and diagnose COVID-19. Um, and then outside of class and the classroom experiences, we're also doing a lot of volunteer activities, much like what Dina was saying. Um, I am one of many students um, throughout Michigan and in many other states that are also like Dina is working on hotlines um, um, specifically through a Michigan State University coordinated with the state of Michigan to 
um, have a provider hotline where we'll actually be triaging provider calls and um, assigning laboratory testing to triage that way. We also have students, and this is um, resounding throughout the country too, is um, working in a babysitting. Um, we call it Michigan COVID sitters, um, but there's a need for healthcare workers, especially frontline healthcare workers who don't have any access to childcare anymore. And so medical students are getting into the homes and providing childcare for those providers. Um, and then there, we're trying to slowly work our way into clinical experiences, but I think we're, we're working towards where we can most be utilized. Um, and one of those is testing. Um, many students come into medical school that have a vast science knowledge, PhDs, masters, whatever it may be. And so they're working on getting those students into testing labs and participating in those efforts so we can um, help out in the front lines. It's a many faceted response and it changes every day. I think we get more and more opportunities um, depending on where we're at. So it, it's it's dynamic and, and the schools are doing a very good job at keeping us engaged and helping to fill in the gaps that unfortunately got created. Dr. Lummis, how are you seeing the opportunities for students uh, since you have a pretty broad view at many institutions? So I think you've heard between Dina and Jordan's comments, there's two layers to this. There are the COVID related activities and it's been wonderful to see students be creative and step up to, to different kinds of value added roles without having direct contact with patients. And so we do have guidelines around the safety of those types of volunteer roles on our COVID-19 resource page. Uh, and we actually hosted a webinar last week on alternative roles for students during this time. But I think another pressing concern is how do we get back to the core curriculum that the students were intended to be completing? The COVID facing activities do develop a lot of important competencies, particularly around communication and teamwork. And so they're valuable, but that I think you heard from both students, there are some core things that they were supposed to be doing now and how do they get back to that? Uh, the AMA sponsors the Accelerating Change in Medical Education Innovation Consortium. And we have a series of calls with our PIs in that group coming up in the in next week to talk about what we're considering reviving the core clerkships. Uh, how do we get back from the bridging didactics that you heard described uh, and then the sort of indirect patient contact and then move into direct patient contact when it's safe and appropriate and which activities require that and which can be met through virtual and other means. So we're hoping to tap into our uh, rich network of creative educators to get students on the path of their intended education while they continue to serve uh, the current need. Thank you, Dr. Lomas. Uh, that's it for today's COVID-19 update. I wanna thank our guests, Dr. Kimberly Lomas, uh, Jordan Lippincott and Dina Kashawi. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with another update. Uh, in the meantime, for additional resources on COVID-19, including our guides for students and residents, go to ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.